Hello, fellow Crusaders, and welcome to our latest episode of the Weekly Crusaders. My name is Sean Wasser Krug, and as always, is Brian Michaels. And today we are talking about two movies that came out during the week of uh we're we're we're, about, we're behind, so I'm <laughs> gonna backtrack. Uh it's uh, September 24th through September 30th. Um it is uh one movie that is like I said, once in a blue moon, Brian and I think we're the only person who's ever watched this film, and then we find out that the other one has actually watched it and enjoyed it. So it's one of the reasons why we're great co-hosts together. Uh, and then another movie is a film that I have always heard about, never knew what it was about. I knew who was in it, uh, but I never seen it until until this week, and that's what Brian chose. Um, before we jump in, because uh, I don't have the pictures behind me because I'm in a different location right now, uh, what, what do you think about these two movies before we jump in? Yeah, I mean, they're both movies that <laughs> I, I, that, that, I, that I always thought I really liked. Um, one of them, The Fisher King. I mean, they've clicked on the thumbnail. They know what the movie is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's actually a movie I, I I really like, and and I liked it at the time, and I've liked it all the way up till now. And by the way, I'm I'm in that movie. Look at the credits. Little boy is played by Brian Michaels. Just saying. <laughs> well, do you get residuals? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not, it's not actually me, of course. Um, had to put the disclaimer in there. Um, the other one, your your movie is like you said, it's one that we always talked about, and we're like, oh yeah, I saw that movie. I really like that movie. I'm not sure I liked it as much, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to be starting with Brian's film. And I, like you said, it's it's uh, 1991's uh, The Fisher King. Uh, the Fisher King came out September 27th, 1991, had a budget of $24 million, had a weekend opening of $7.07 million. It did make uh, around 312000 in earlier releases. Um, and then uh, it was number one, its opening weekend for wide release. It had spent three weeks at the number one spot. And had a finished box office of seventy-two point four million, forty-one point zero nine million domestic, and thirty point five million international. Now, I love Robin Williams, and it was one of those things where it's like we've all enjoyed Robin, and it wasn't until he was taken from us that we all were like, "Man, we didn't appreciate Robin as much as we probably should have appreciated Robin Williams," and. Uh, I, I was shocked. As isn't isn't next year like the ten year anniversary? Like, didn't he die Something in Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I remember I was at my kid's soccer practice when I when the news came through. And so yeah, it's probably yeah. been about ten years. Ah, that's just ten years. Wow, it's it's it sucks. But um, but yeah, I it, it is one of those things we always appreciate his comedies, and but there's so many people who've never seen his dramatic roles. Now this one, he's, he's doing both, but it's much more of a dramatic thing with, with his comedic elements. And I always forget like at this time of the year or this time in his career, he was on fire, like with awards. Cause he had, he was, he was not, I think was it three years in a row for best actor, whether it's supporting or because he had, he had a good morning Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Then he had, um, dead poets of style. Yeah, Dead Poets Society, and and then this. I think like, they were two years oh. apart. I think it was 87, 89, 91. So, yeah. Okay. So, but yeah, but it was just like, it was one of those things where it was like, everyone knows him from like, oh, Aladdin and, you know, Jumanji and Jack and all these other films. And it was like, dude, in the late 80s, like, Robin Williams was probably one of the best actors in Hollywood, but no one ever, like, talks about that. Um, but, but this is your movie, so so go ahead and, and take it away with The Fisher King. Yeah, so Fish King is a movie uh, came out in 1991, um, starring Jeff Bridges, Robin Williams, Mercedes Rule, Amanda Plummer, uh, directed by Terry Gilliam, which this is an interesting time in Terry Gilliam's career because he's he's one of the guys from Monty Python. Uh, he was tended to be more like the animator. He was played smaller characters. He wasn't one of the leads. But, you know, he did the Monty Python movies, and then, you know, he did some some smaller movies, things like Brazil, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then once he, he hit the 90s and he went on this stretch a great 90s stretch did like this and 12 monkeys and fear and loathing in las vegas and the, the, so this movie is kind of like his first mainstream real mainstream movie and he just knocked it out of the park in my opinion um this well the first of all this, this movie is basically the story of uh jeff bridges is like this shock jock dj like a howard stern type yeah. um he makes some flippant comments on the air to somebody some a caller that calls in who's clearly troubled uh that guy goes on to murder a bunch of people in a nightclub um so jeff bridges obviously his life and career goes into a spiral uh and then he comes across a man who it turns out that he was affected by this tragedy and you know 
he, he feels like he needs to redeem himself by helping out this person. Maybe that will, you know, get his life back in the, in the right direction, things like that. Um, that's the basic, basic plot of the movie. Um, first of all, I just want to say that this movie, uh, cast wise is amazing. Jeff Bridges, I've always liked, and this, I think might be my favorite performance ever of his. Um, I think he's such a great job in this from when he's playing like the, you know, the self-centered shock jock all the way down to when he's like, you know, at his lowest point. Um, I, I love Jeff Bridges in this. Honestly, I feel like he should have been nominated for best actor. He didn't even get a nomination for this though. Cause they pushed Rob Williams for best actor, even though it's really Jeff Bridges. He got, he, he, he got supporting for this. I think Robin, Robin got nominated for it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, no, Robin got nominated for lead. That's right. Uh, Cause I was like, Oh, who did he lose? And I was like, Oh, he lost to Hopkins. Well, that's just it. I had a whole breakdown of, of the Oscars for this. Cause okay. Robin Williams should have been nominated for supporting actor because he's got a big part in it, but he's definitely the supporting role in this. This is Jeff Bridges' story. But Jeff Bridges wasn't nominated. They put Robin there. It wouldn't matter because Jeff wouldn't won either. Anthony Hopkins won, and rightfully so. Um, Mercedes Rule won for Best Supporting Actress. Um, I would have nominated Amanda Plummer, honestly, as well. And I actually probably would have given her the award over Mercedes Rule, but I have no problem with the Mercedes Rule winning because she did a great job in it as well. Um, this movie lost best screenplay to Thelma and Louise of all things. It lost art direction to Bugsy. I mean, this has more art direction than Bugsy. Uh, it should have been nominated for best picture, but no, instead they nominated Bugsy and Prince of Tides. Um, Gilliam didn't get directed, but Ridley Scott did for Thelma and Louise. I just have I had, I had a whole rant about the Oscars on, in my <laughs> notes here. Um, but yeah, and, we already talk, and you already mentioned Rob Williams, who of course he had been nominated, like you said, for, for two roles before this. He didn't finally win until Goodwill Hunting, of course, but he was phenomenal in it. Um, so cast wise, great. Um, the story of it, I especially love the opening. The opening where you see him, um, Jeff Bridges doing his shock shock thing, and right mm -hmm. up, right up through the whole sequence till he you know hears on the radio what happened, and just he says you know oh, fuck you know, and, and then you know his he knows his life comes crashing down, and they cut to his life was it three years later? I, three years later, yeah, yeah, where he's you know, living with his girlfriend above the video store, you know, helping her work there. And his, his life is just a shadow of what it used to be. And I just, I just kind of love that whole opening sequence to it. Um, let me see. Rob Williams, of course, gets to do, he gets to do his comedic stuff. You know, he's doing his usual thing, but that's just because the, the kind of character that Perry is, he's, he's a homeless guy. He's mentally ill. Clearly at this point, he's gone through this tragedy. Um, but it, it, I think this is some of his most dramatic work of his career, or at least up to this point, was probably some of his most dramatic stuff. Um, and yes, they do have those, you know, comedic moments to it. Um, but I think it all, it it made sense because it's like, it's this guy who he's blocking out this tragedy in his life. You know, he just thinks he's, you know, a whole different person. And then anytime the the tragedy, the, the, the reality does try to creep its way back into his memory, it basically... Uh, manifest itself as like this you know red knight who's coming to kill him and things like that and and that's where i think the film does it gets a little bit too terry gilliam sometimes when he gets the more fantastical stuff but i think it kind of made sense here because it's from his perspective um i'll go into more but first what are your thoughts having seen it for the first time <laughs> this is this is this is um this is gonna be interesting a conversation it really really is because once again I had no idea what this movie was. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch a trailer. I didn't read. I actually, I did. I did read the, the synopsis, but it wasn't. The synopsis is pretty basic. It's just basically like you know this radio jock or former radio DJ, uh, you know, feeling karma's up against him. Basically, runs into a, a homeless man whose life's been affected by his previous incidents, and he tries to help him. So that could be anything, you know. So when you go into the movie, I'm like, all right, I I, I don't know what. I'm expecting. I just know that Robin Williams plays a homeless guy. That, that's the only thing I knew going into this film. Um, there's, and this, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna chalk this up to being an older movie because it's a '90s movie. We, we're, we're, that's our generation. '80s, '90s is our generation, and then you know all the way through. So, I'm, I don't think some of these performances are as good as as you really? think. I'm not saying they're bad. They're not bad, personally. Um, I love Jeff Bridges. I do. And it's 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 a it's one of those things that it's a double edged sword. And that's and because I can't I, I've been thinking about this movie for a few days because I was like, okay, I was like, I know we're gonna have to talk about this. Like, how do I I don't want to attack this movie because I didn't hate the movie. I didn't. 
Um, but it's like, but I didn't necessarily enjoy the movie. And I was like, well, why didn't I enjoy the movie? Um, uh, I enjoy parts of it. There's, there's a lot that I liked, but there's a lot of stuff that just irked me. And to the point where it was like, I appreciate this film. I appreciate all the recognition it got, but is it a movie that I would ever rewatch again? And I was like, why wouldn't I rewatch this? And one, I love Jeff Bridges. I fucking hate his character in this movie. And that's that's one of those things. That's that's one of those things that, like, say, is a double edged sword because you you want to have a character that because if a character is unlikable, it's one of two ways. Either because the guy's acting his ass off out of the park and he's doing it so well that you love to hate him, or they're doing it so bad that like, oh god, this guy's such a horrible performer. I I it ruins the movie for me. Jeff Bridges is doing a phenomenal job at being this egotistical self-centered jackass he's definitely not a likable guy like e- even after yeah. he's not even yeah. after he's fallen he's still doing everything he's for such, his own benefit yeah he's such a now he's not like pushing over kids and and stuff like yeah. that but his character and even as he thinks he's doing good shit he's still just a douche through this with it to his girlfriend and stuff like that and it just it like throughout the whole movie i'm like i honestly don't want this guy to have a happy ending he doesn't deserve it. He's a jackass. This whole film. Like, Perry deserves a happy ending. His fucking girlfriend deserves a happy ending. Jeff Bridges' character does not deserve a happy ending. Well, especially even, especially even when, when, he, when he started right. to, like, turn his life around, he was, like, newly sober and happy. And also, he had this turn when he's just, like... He went right back to his old way. And I'm just, like... He, and this turn, and he was just going to leave her. You know, he yeah. was just like, thanks for letting me slum here, but I'm rich and successful now, so bye. Yeah, because I'm watching, I was like, God, I really hate his character. But it's like, you know, oh, I was like, well, he'll get with Robin and and you know, or Perry, and you know, oh, he, he'll turn his life around. And it's like, okay, he's he's starting to, he's starting to, but then he just he still just keeps having these moments of just being a, a giant prick. And it's like, all right, well, eventually, you know, it, it's gonna turn. And then you see, okay, it's turning because you have that dinner, and he's looking like you know he's embracing his you know girlfriend. I'm blank, I'm blanking on her freaking name. Uh, his girlfriend. Oh, for um, role she plays uh, uh Anne, 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 yeah. Anne. Uh and I was like, oh, well, he's finally embracing Anne. Okay, good. Because like Anne's she's rough around the edges, but she's actually a really great girl. And I think she deserved the recognition that she got. I thought she was fantastic. Well, I had no so, problem with her. I was just saying Amanda Plummer, I thought also did a great job. But, but yeah, but then you get that moment, like he gets the phone call, and then he just reverts right back to this asshole character. And it's just like like I, I'm sorry, man. I, I can't root for this guy. Like, I actually would love for if this guy had gotten arrested and and caught, like, for stealing the grail thing. And like, 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 granted, he goes to the hospital. He does he does the thing. But at the at the end, he he loses everything because I just I dislike this character so much that it made me not enjoy the film. Like, I love ev- like almost everybody else because there's another character that I really didn't care for. But his his performance, while really really good. It's just so unlikable oh, I that, that. Yeah. it just made me not like this movie as much as I wanted to. And the other person that just, and it's one of those things too, where it's like, you're, you're wanting, cause you're, you're setting the table for everything. You know, you're, you're introducing these, these characters and you're like, okay, so here's Perry. He has this horrible, horrible tragedy, which also when you find out what it is, you're like, oh, damn. <laughs> like, okay, I get it. I get it. And and he's like, oh, I'm in love with this this other girl all of a sudden. And so it's like, oh, okay, well, we're, we're three years ahead. It's fine. Like I'm not I'm not mad that he falls in love with another girl. And you're like, okay, he's he's. And also because in his mind he doesn't even remember the first one. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's like, okay, well he's he's stalking her, but it's harmless because she doesn't recognize him, you know, because apparently the homeless are yeah, all over. He's the not place. doing anything but watching. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, but it's. Then you like, oh, okay, well, we're, let's set him up. And then we meet her. She's not likable either. She's she's a bitch. You know, what, you know what it is for me because like she's 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 very grating. Like when they, they're trying to help her out and she's kind she's of being done. like, you know, where you're standoffish yeah, and stuff. Yeah, she's very just. But but then like uh-huh. I mean, but first of all, especially when she gets like the dinner date, her and Perry are perfect for each other. And I kind of actually, because... I actually loved watching. I actually loved watching Anne and Jack watching them just laughing, like you know. I, I that that was that was like I said. Then that was the one where I was like, okay, the Jack character is actually going to start turning around, and then he like literally less than twenty four hours later he reverts back, just because 
they're both clumsy, which they're not. She's clumsy, and Perry's intentionally being clumsy, so he, she doesn't feel, which is a beautiful Robin Williams moment. I'll get to Robin Williams. She's not a likable character. And granted, you can chalk it up to it looks like she's constantly always picked on and being pulled pranks on it, so she's become jaded. But the whole time I'm watching her, I'm like, couldn't we have gotten someone for, for Perry that, like, I don't know if you would believe it. I don't know if you would believe it for Perry though. If he got like this, this more normal, you know, nice person. I I think that, and especially like you said, once once you hear her give that speech to him, like you know about you know I know what's going to happen next. You're going to come up and you're going to call me and all this stuff, and you kind of understand, like you said, that she's been you know maybe the reason the way she acts the way she does. No, that speech is great. I think she that was a great scene for her, but it was it was more the conversations that she has with with Anne while doing her nails, and Mm -hmm. she's just a super bitch where it's like if i was Anna, I was like all right fuck this i'm just getting your nails and i'm getting you the fuck out of here because it's like the whole time i'm watching i'm like are we like we're, we're supposed to root for her because perry loves her but i was like the whole time i was like we can find someone else for perry like perry deserves better than this like well, and, but, fair, but, with all these but, unlikable people there's probably the most accurate portrayal of new yorkers on film so <laughs> i get that it's but it's just one of those things where it's like th- there's four four mainish characters and two of them i can't stand on screen and then the other two i love and appreciate so it's one of those things where it's like i enjoy the story i i enjoyed the aspects of it but when you have two leads respectively at that point that i just can't stand watching how they're portraying the characters and it's nothing against their performances because i think they're acting their asses off in this movie all of them do great but it's just so unlikable that it just kept not necessarily taking me out of the movie but just kept made me go I kind of don't want the happy ending that I know I'm going to get because I don't feel like, like, and, and granted, like after the whole Perry thing happened after the date, I was like, oh man, Anne's going to be even worse than before. But they don't even give her that time, that screen time. They don't give it to her, which I thought was kind of a, a messed up thing. Like we don't get to see what happens to Anne when Anne finds out what happens to Perry. Like we don't get that, which I thought I mean, that Lydia, was a right? What? Lydia, Amanda Plummer. I'm sorry, Lydia. Yeah, we don't. We never get to see what happens to Lydia when she finds out what happened to Perry. We don't get that, and I felt like that was a scene that she should have. She should have been owed. As much as I don't like her character, I I'm, I was afraid. It's like, oh man, she's gonna think that Perry ditched her. That's why I thought that was Perry too. But I then we, we just see her at the hospital. So apparently, yeah, I was like, I thought we were gonna get that moment. We were gonna get that scene, and we didn't. We just get kind of like a fast forward. Um, and I'm just like. I guess I assume yeah. that when when Jack and Anne find out, they've they've contacted her too. I don't know. Well, we don't know because at that because they're they're dealing with their own shit at that moment, you know. So it's one of those things where it's like we don't know how she finds out or yeah. anything. I feel like that was a scene that was greatly missing from this. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was just it, it's those two characters are so just unlikable to a point. Now, like I said, Anne's is is understood and deserved. And I, it might just be because I'm not a huge. Amanda Plummer fan because to me she's always just the crazy sister from So I Married an Ex Murderer. So her performances are always just kind of grating to me. But it's just it's just those first few scenes of hers that I'm just like, uh, I don't. Rob, Perry deserves better than this. <laughs> but um, but yeah, Bridges. I just oh god, I I hate that he had the happy ending that he had. Now Robin though, I I agree with what you said. This is probably one of Robin's most dramatic and beautiful performances. Um, and even with his comedy side, it's really only for the most part, his first two scenes. Other than that, after that, he he's, he's, he's got little moments here that he's staying in a lane to, to not go over the top. It's, it's mainly that, that introduction of him where he's full on Robin Williams, which yeah. I love. And then you get, I think the scene where, um, when Jack wakes up in his, in the basement with him and he's still full on Robin. It isn't until later that it's like, oh, okay, you know, he, Robin's toning it down. but and, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that he's toning it down for the character and it's working. But honestly, one of my favorite aspects of this film was the Red Knight. Like, because like at first I was like, because he describes the Red Knight. And I'm like, okay. And then he finds, I'm like, oh, shit. And then you, and then you hear, um, I think it was the landlord of, ha- of, of, of the building that Perry's, you know, mm-hmm. staying in describing what the red knight represents or looks like and represents and then you see the design i'm like that is fucked up but brilliant yeah. at the same time and that some my favorite performance if i had to pick like a favorite scene of this and as as heartbreaking as it is it, it is that moment right after that that date 
where you know Perry puts it all out there, and I'm like, oh, you shouldn't have done that, Perry. That's gonna go badly, and, and it didn't. It went. It went perfect for him, and he's in the street and he's celebrating, and then there it is. Yeah, he, he starts feeling like he's falling in love again. So memories and reality start creeping yeah. back in. So of course it manifests itself with this night. And, and the moment I, that got me is when he's like, you know, let me have that, this. Yes, he's begging yeah. and he's pleading. And I'm just like, dude, you are destroying me in the best way. And it's just like this is this is the thing where I feel like no people don't appreciate Robin Williams for the range of acting he can give because he's a hilarious guy. He's phenomenal and he has that heart of gold. But oh my god, that scene is like the equivalent of, of of kicking a puppy, throwing it in a bag, and drowning it. Because it's like, oh my god, dude, you are destroying me. And then he's running, and I'm like, oh man, he's gonna run away, and he's gonna forget about Aunt or uh, Lydia. I keep Aunt, Lydia. And I'm like, oh man, it's gonna go bad. And then we get the callback to the guys, and I'm just like, because because I got I got worried real quick because like he's like. He says thank you, and then you know, it looks like the you know the red knight stabs him. And I'm like, did they just fucking kill him? And then they're like, no, they just beat the shit out of him. And I was just like, I was like, if they, because I was like, if they kill Perry, I go, I fucking hate this movie. Because I was like, I was already like, mm. and then I was like, oh man, I swear to God, if they if they kill Perry, like I flip the fucking table. I'm so which, mad. Which uh, just a little little side note, um, the the main guy, one of the guys that the two guys that beat him up, both the yeah. beginning or they meet at the beginning, and then they beat him up yeah. again. Uh, was his son in the birdcage? I never got a good close enough like look at him to see who that was. But that's the other thing too. like he's like, we don't let your cat around here. You homeless. Like he's wearing a fucking suit. He ain't homeless. What's what homeless guy wears that? Like yeah, come on, you guys are just assholes. But, I, I assume that they recognized him for is the guy. I don't know. I don't know. Oh no, he was dirty as shit. There's no way they recognized his ass because he's all clean and and uh, to a point. But but yeah, but like the the story. That we did get, I, I I think it's 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 an incredibly well done story. I think the acting, as much as I don't like the characters, is well done throughout. I I think Terry Gilliam's um the Red Knight thing and how they chase him at one point, and and Jack's like I don't know what we're chasing, I don't know what we're doing, and then like he he gets falls behind and comes back there, and 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 Perry's just like kind of at peace at that moment on top of the rock, and Jack's like what what the hell you know, kind of thing, but just the visual design of the red knight. And yeah. then we, cause, cause it's one of the things like they tell you what happened to Perry and you're like, okay, that, wow, that's, that's rough. That sucks. But we didn't think we were actually going to see it. And then they show it. Which yeah, feels on top of that scene as well. And I'm just like, oh man. And I want to give a special shout out because outside of obviously the main four who are great for the roles, I, my favorite performance outside of Robin, Michael fucking Jeter. <laughs> I fucking love him in this because I saw him and I'm like, I'm like, I love this guy. And I was like, I was like, okay, I was like, I'll, you know, he's probably just in two scenes. And then when he goes to do the telegram, dude, Rob fucking O. And the whole time I'm watching, I'm like, I hope he's in more of this. I and mean, you only get that one last scene of him. And it's such a heart, it's such a, you know, like I said, a douchebag scene from Jack. But dude, Michael Jeter, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. Like, you know, I mean, rest in peace, dude. But I I was so happy that we got that scene of him just going full on out. I loved that moment. But um, yeah, back to you on it. Oh, well, um, I mean, you covered most of it what I was talking about. I do want to um also as far as just a, a one scene supporting character, Tom Waits, I thought was a lot of fun. As like the he's the homeless guy who's like, you know, collecting coins and talking about he, he gets like that one scene. But yeah, he was yeah. good. But, but but I enjoyed him in that. Um, but the one other Rob Williams scene I wanted to bring up um, was like we like I was talking about with the, after the date, but before before he gets attacked or has his you know starts to remember his breakdown um, when Liddy gives that whole speech about you know how I know you know what's going to happen next you know we're going to go upstairs and have coffee you're going to stay over but then you're not going to call and blah 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 and I just love the way he's like slow down you know I haven't gotten the first kiss and that's the best part like, like why are you skipping to the end of this yeah. It's like we we we've gotten together, we've made love, and we've broken up, and we haven't even had the first kiss yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a good, that's such a good line. I was like, I was like, that's that's yeah. We've been yeah. there, bro. We've been there. Pete girls do that shit. Um, yeah, but no, I, I thought this movie. I thought I thought it looked great. I thought it was acted great. I thought it was written great. Um, Terry Gilliam, like during the '90s, was actually one of my favorite directors because, like I said, he had that great run of a few films, and then he kind of just fell off big time. 
Um, so I, I, I've not liked his other stuff nearly as much, but, but his stuff in the nineties was great. Uh, the cast I assembled here is awesome. So this is one that I at least wanted to share with you. I'm glad you, it, it, I, obviously I didn't think you would like it as much as I did. Um, but I'm glad you at least enjoyed it. In spite, in spite of the stuff that I did not like, it's still for me, a, a three and a half star film. Had I a, a, enjoyed a, the performances better, as much as I appreciate the performances, had I enjoyed the characters a little bit better, which writing wise, that's that's more mm-hmm. their thing. I would have probably enjoyed it better, but it's one of those things where it's like, as much as I love the performances of Anne and, and Perry, rewatchability for this is 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 very low for me because I just I I want to punch Jack in the face, which See, that's, it, the, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. But it's just yeah. I hate that he got his happy ending. I don't think well, even I, even I, uh, I love this movie, but I probably watch it. It's not one I rewatch on a regular basis. It's one I've probably watched like once every, you know, eight years or so. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's just oh god, I, I was like the whole time watching, I was like, this is gonna be such a hard conversation with Brian because I know Brian loves this movie because it's like you gave it five stars. I'm just like, I fucking can't stand Jack. <laughs> I hate Jack so goddamn much. Um, but you know yeah, what? I, I, I think the thing is when we when we disagree on movies, for the most part. Like if you don't like something, even I give it five stars, I don't consider that a bad thing. Especially if you at least liked it, I'm like I'll consider that a win, you know, kind yeah. of thing. There's yeah. very few movies that would, would you know end the Weekend Crusaders or the, the movie Crusaders. Yeah, um, and we've made it through a couple of those. So yeah, there there are there are the occasional ones that we're like, dude, I hate you for making me watch this movie. And a lot of times it's more for a joke, but like ones where it's like, hey, like I actually love this. It's like let's be a little more respectful to it. Like not just like, dude, your tastes are shit kind of thing but yeah it's just one of things where it's like i was like i wanted to love this more than i did but yeah but yeah robin uh, Williams king is not available to watch free anywhere right now but check but it yeah, out it, if you guys are fans of robin williams and you guys have never watched this movie go out of your way to watch it just for his performance because it is a fantastic performance uh we're gonna be moving over over to my film and like i said this is one of those movies that uh I'm, let me set the let's set the scale here because I know Brian's gonna get a chuckle out of this, but I bet, I guarantee you he watched it the same fucking way. Back in the day, for all you youngins who don't watch cable anymore, youngins. yeah, uh, who only watch streaming and Netflix and stuff, when we had cable and we were at a certain age, there was a certain time of the night that we would flip to certain channels for certain type of content, Cinemax which was dubbed Skinamax. Uh, after 10 o'clock, you would get certain movies that were more colorful and certain a- aspects. And uh, sometimes you randomly find a movie that you actually enjoy watching. And because it's a, a Cinemax or Stars or HBO or whatever, usually I think it'll be, a, what, like two weeks or like a month, it'll be the same schedule. So it's like, oh, it'll be this movie will be on at 10 o'clock for like two straight weeks or something like that. So you like one enough. And then all of a sudden, you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm going to put this movie on like every fucking night for the next week or two because I enjoy watching it. And that's what happened with this movie. This movie, I, I didn't even hear, know about. I knew this movie existed until I was just scrolling through the channels one night. And naturally, obviously, the plot makes it go, oh, this is going to be one of those movies to watch. And it's not kind of to that point. <laughs> but then it got to the point where it was like, oh, I know these people. Oh, cool. And then it's like, you know what? All right. And that, that, that is the movie dubbed 100 Girls. Uh, 100 Girls came out September 25th, 2000. Uh, could not find the budget for it. It was not released in domestic theaters. It was only released internationally. So no opening weekend ranking. Its finished box office was 132555 only internationally. Why it was only released internationally? No fucking idea. But that's all I could find on 100 Girls. Um, why I think Brian and I enjoy this film as besides the general plot which the general plot real quick for anyone who doesn't who's probably never seen this movie which is probably like 99 percent of you is you you follow this this character um there's his name here uh matthew uh you know the college kid stuff like that he there's this one there's like an all girls dorm that has a hundred girls in it the, the name hundred girls and he's uh, there, he was at a party and he was leaving. He got in the elevator and this girl got in the elevator with him and her, you know, she was had her, like laundry all the way up to here so you couldn't see her face. And they're in the elevator and then a power outage happens and they're stuck in the elevator. They have a phenomenal night of passion in that elevator, but they never get to see each other. 
So he wakes up the next morning, power's back on, elevator door opens, she's already left. And so he's trying, he thinks, you know, oh, this is the woman, this is the love of my life, I gotta find her. I know she's in this dorm, but I have no idea which woman it is. So he basically keeps infiltrating the dorm as like the repair guy and starts kind of investigating and getting to know the women to see if he can try to figure out which woman was the woman from the elevator. That's the main plot of this movie. Um, which, granted, like I said, 2000s, raunchy sex comedy, 100 girls in a dorm, and a guy. Do the math to a <laughs> point. Um, but the reason why Brian and I appreciate it as much as we do is because of who plays Matthew, which is we almost need like a like a movie crusaders MVP appreciation, like like <laughs> like, a, like 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 a like the laundry mat they put up like celebrities. Like we almost need like a like a celebrity wall. Like we love these guys and we or and women and appreciate them. And that is Jonathan Tucker. Jonathan Tucker is a, a great actor. He's so great, uh, and he's not utilized in in Hollywood the way we we feel he should be utilized. Um, and this is one of his very earlier roles. Uh, but we we love Jonathan Tucker very, very much. Now, in terms of the rest of the cast, there are names here that people will recognize. Some will cringe at, and one mainly. But this was back when she wasn't a raging bitch and was actually likable, and that's Katherine Heigl. <laughs> um, you also got, uh, I'm going to say her last name wrong, Emmanuel, is it Kukui? It's like Shrieky or something like that. Okay. I'm, I've never known how to pronounce that. Which... I, I, if you see her, you're like, oh, she's from blah, 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 blah. Most people know from Entourage. Yeah, so I, was like, I know her mostly from Entourage. Uh, you also got um, Jamie Presley, uh, Lars, is, is Larissa it Olenek. Olenek, which many people will know from like 10 Things I Hate About You and The Secret World of Alex Mack for you young Nickelodeon, uh, you know, Snick fans. Um, I think that's basically it for people who, that you would probably recognize and then it's a bunch of like people they're like oh they're that person was probably in like this one movie as like random guy number four kind of thing um but i set the table i'm gonna go over to brian because brian started this thing off as he doesn't like it as much as he remembered well here's so. the thing is is this was essentially a first time watch for me because i i had seen the movie i know for sure i'd seen the movie and i liked the movie and i remember like well the movie. obviously you you and i both were like hundred girls yeah and so but I, I watched it this time i'm like i don't other than the synopsis the plot synopsis i'm like i don't remember this movie at all honestly i didn't remember that you know it, the elevator thing is what's led to this whole i remember nothing about this movie except for jonathan tucker and a bunch of girls so essentially watching me for the first time um as far as why i liked it in the past maybe like you said just you know it had a lot of boobs in it i don't know um but not, <laughs> not even as much as you expect like you said it's like you would think because oh, of, honestly, uh, I thought it was going to be none. But I thought it was going to be a lot of like revealing clothing. Oh and stuff. no, I, like, oh, I thought it was going to be a lot. I thought it was going to be a lot raunchier than it was <laughs> back back in two thousands around that time of the night playing on those channels. Yeah, should have been a lot more raunchy. See, I didn't catch any of those channels. I, I want to say that I actually like rented it, like in like a blockbuster, or whatever. Or I, I might even got it as like a Netflix mail away DVD, which as of this week doesn't exist. Um, oh yeah, that ended this week. Yeah, yeah, but it's like. <sighs> So I'm watching this movie and it's it's you know, a little formulaic. Um, it's it's horribly horribly written uh, the dialogue, which I'll get into that. But it's still enjoyable. That's the thing. Like like okay, uh, let's get into the dialogue now. It's super cringy. The the, the banter and the things like that. It's overly I mean, it's two thousand. It's two thousand. Well, yeah, it's overly even wordy. Like two thousand standards. It's crazy. Well, it, that's just it. It's this overly wordy like unnatural dialogue. Which was almost kind of like what a lot of movies are doing. It was like Kevin Williamson did it with Dawson's Creek and with Scream and some of those things. Yeah. Um, Kevin Smith was doing it with his early movies, well, with all his movies. Um, you know, so it's like, and like the opening scene that 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 elevator silhouette sex scene when he's saying things like "my impressive manhood in my pants expanded like Jiffy Pop popcorn." I'm it's like, almost it's almost like this whole like open dialogue is because he was writing a book at the end. But then that's just not. it. It starts out like that. I'm like, okay, this is just being like funny dialogue because of the way he's narrating yeah. the story. But no, throughout the whole movie, actual conversations are like these this unnatural dialogue, which he, was he he word vomits a lot. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like, yeah. So I like a little bit of it is of the time, but also it would have done much better during the time either. So. There's that thing, but like I said, despite these things, I still, I still did enjoy the movie. I, I I'm not mm -hmm. gonna. I, I think I ended up giving it three stars out of five, which is a very average score. But honestly, that, that's exactly where this belongs because it's not great, but it's not bad. It's still fun to watch. Yeah, it's 
it's um, it's one of those that reminds me of like I said, it's not like a top tier film. It's one of those movies that we remember fondly from when we were younger. Uh, it hasn't aged well by today's standards. But well, oh, this I, is yet another. I think half the movies you talk about on this channel would not get made today. <laughs> yes, but it's also one of those things where it's like because you and I were like we'll watch we're like. That wouldn't work for today, but that doesn't deter, deter it for us. Oh, I, st I still enjoy the hell out of this movie. Exactly. I, don't care, I don't care about political correctness. And like, I mean, people would complain on this movie just because it dares to objectify women and and reinforce like classic definition but, but of that's beauty. The, that's the thing is, is that it objectifies women, but it also empowers them because yeah. Jonathan Tucker's character, Matthew, is like finally kind of understanding women. Like, he, not that he ever really used them because he's not like Stifler from America. But this Pie. is that early, two, late, late 90s, early 2000s thing where like, every woman except for the ones that are supposed to be like you know like yeah. hideous every woman in the movie is just a complete hottie well yeah it's even like, even the one that they treat as like the fucking ugliest girl possible it's oh, like, yeah, that's a rabisi yeah 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 it's like, but then like, sister by the way yeah like they pretty her up by the movie it's like she's a she's an attractive girl like she's not like fugly as shit yeah. now granted in that dorm room like if we were yeah. if we were watching a uh, oh god uh sorority boys she would be in the doghouse <laughs> but it's like but it's like she's unattractive. Well, but even when we watched yeah. sorority boys, we said half the women in that exactly in that not doghouse were cuter than the ones in the half exactly. sorority. Exactly, it was just more or less because they just didn't want to be in the conformity of 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 you know the uh, sorority, so they just yeah. threw them in there kind of thing. But yeah, it's like the one character that probably just could not work today is is the roommate, which is um. Oh, God, yeah. by James DeBello. He's that was such a 2000s character. Yeah, it's like if you take his character out of the movie, I think the movie actually could still work today. A thousand percent. It's his character, which it's even one of those things too. It's like, because you keep, you keep, he keeps, or Matthew keeps going up like something has happened to him in his past that makes him hate women or degrade women the way he does. And and honestly, the one, and I forgot about this characteristic of, of Rod is that he has these these like uh, what weighted balls that he hangs on his dick to make his dick bigger and a whole movie he is literally like acting at most of his scenes with these balls dangling off of his balls or his dick and as he's just degradingly talking shit about women like you know stuff like that it's like so his character is not necessarily likable but then it's like you find out what what's wrong with him or what happened to him and even that's like could we have written something a little bit better for his character for a reason why but it's like I get it. Like there's the like his his not that his explanations are are founded. Like okay, well that makes sense why he's a like you know why he treats one. It's like no, it's like he's he's still a dick. But I get why he feels that way. But it doesn't like you know nullify his his yeah. attitude towards everything. But each character in this movie, and I know I know I'm either gonna get a look from you from this or or what. But I'm gonna stand. I'm gonna die on this hill. They treat Jamie Presley like she's the fucking hottest woman in, in, at the college. She, no, she's not. She's and about the, 10 and, times girl in not, dorm. Exactly. And, 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 and Jamie Presley's attractive. She is. I'm not saying she's not. She's very attractive. But Catherine Heigl, I would, I would pick over Jamie Presley, especially in this movie. But she's tomboyish, like, which makes her unlikable. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. How dare she like to play hideous. Football? And then, of course, they make her a lesbian. It's like, yeah, uh, take off the overalls, let her hair down, then she'd be hot, right? Oh, yeah. But, like, I'm sorry. Uh, Patty? <laughs> like, I mean, they treat Patty like she's, like... like which, okay, let me, let me talk about Patty for a second. Okay, so... Oh, wait, there is another character that does not work. Oh, but, keep, but, yeah, keep going, keep going. But there's another character that definitely doesn't work. <laughs> so, okay, so Patty, when he meets her... He's going through the dorm and he sees her like her her boyfriend or whoever it is. He's, like, that is the character that would not work today. <laughs> and, and, and like being rough with Ooh. her stuff. And he comes in and basically stops it. And then she like basically just jumps him. Like, I mean, she's straddling him and she's flirting with him. And it's just like, you don't like me? And I'm like, I just fucking met you. And then and then she's like, you know, people think I'm a slut. I'm thinking, I wonder why. I mean, but it's still a manual. <laughs> Like, dude, you're in college. Play ball, which eventually he does. But that's just well, that's just it. it is I mean, she, she's she's absolutely hot and stuff like. But my whole thing is they're trying to make her out as like this person who's like being persecuted, and people call me a slut. It's like, well, this 
okay, one guy's beating you up. Another guy walks in. You're already jumping him. In, in the first time yeah. you meet him, you're attacking him. You're trying to have sex with him. You're discussing your Benoit balls with him and all this stuff. And, and later on in the movie, when he actually does hook up with her, he said, I wrote this quote down. He said, maybe that's why God made women like this. So guys like me would have something to practice on. And I'm like, what the fuck is that line? <laughs> This would not get but into then, a movie today. But then, like, like not even a minute later, he feels so bad that he used her. But, but so what does he do? It. So what does he do? He he ignores her. He leaves her alone yeah. and doesn't bother her the rest of the movie. And then you find out that she's the girl. And I, but even then, I get that line. It's like, you know, she's like, "You're not. You don't love me." She's like, "He's like, no, no, it's you." He goes, "No." She goes, "You don't look at me the way someone who was in love with someone would look at me." Mm. And she's like. She's like, you look at me that way now because you realize it was me. She's like, you've you've been around me for months. She goes, and she goes, and you don't look at me that way. So why now should that change? Which is like, yeah, that's a very valid point. Like it's it it it's valid as hell for that. And I also want to chalk it up, but it it's it, because you get to this point in the film because he starts hanging out with all the not all hundred women, but he starts hanging around with like the, a, a good ten to fifteen of them, and and they're all getting these moments. So that way you can kind of go like, oh, who's the woman going to be? Who's the woman going to be? And so he keeps having these like, I wouldn't say necessarily intimate moments, but moments where it's like, oh, okay, I wouldn't mind seeing him with them. I wouldn't mind seeing him with her and stuff like that. And especially um, uh, Larissa Olenek's Wendy. Cause it's like the whole time you're watching them, it's like this, this works. Like I would be happy oh, to date from, her. From the, from the opening scene from her first yeah. scene. I, like I said, I don't remember this movie. I assumed it was going to be her. I'm like, this is oh, so no, predictable. It too, it's too on the nose. I'm like, this is so predictable. But this this 2000s movie, they're, they're all predictable. So I'm like, oh, it's totally going to be her. He's going to be this person. Well, first of all, okay, first of all, he's snooping around in her room and stuff. He, he's snooping through dorm rooms and she comes across him and finds him. And she's not even mad about it. She's just like, oh, I know who you are. And it's like, well, okay with this dude. She sprayed him. She sprayed him with like hairspray. Yeah, and but as soon as she realized, realized she's like, oh, was. it's okay that you're here snooping around in my room. I think, I think it was more or less just like, oh, you're harmless. And kind then she nice. and then he explains her what he's doing, and she's like, not only does she not think he's a stalking psycho, but she's like, oh, that's so romantic. That Let you're me help you. Yeah, kind of and then she wants to help. Which, which, okay, when she's helping him out, I, this is just one thing during the montage that bothered me. Um, when like somebody's come back in the dorm when he's in their room, and she's like, caca, caca. I'm like, like, that's not obvious. <laughs> that doesn't work in an indoor setting. But <laughs> sorry, it's also. It's also college. They're probably like, all right, weirdo. I know. They're like, whatever. We don't give a shit. But it's one um, of those things where it's like the Wendy character is the one character that honestly, like, and granted, I, I, Patty is, is great. Like, I, I'm totally would be down to be with Patty. But it's just like you're watching the movie. And it's like Wendy seems to be like the one character that actually like gets Matthew and understands Matthew. And like, I feel like a relationship there. But it's like you're watching the movie. It's like, oh, well, shit. What can we do to make sure that? You know, even even when he eventually makes up with um, Catherine Heigl's character Arlene, it's like, okay, like he respects her on on a different level. It's like they could work. It's like, all right, well, we gotta be, we gotta make sure that everyone's okay. That Patty is is the one. Oh, we'll make them gay, <laughs> so that we were knocking when, them when off. When, when she told him, she's like, I'm a lesbian. I'm like, with that haircut, no shit. <laughs> oh, thanks. I hate it. hated the haircut. Yeah. I'm sorry. But it's just it's one of those things where it's like they, they start just knocking him off the board so that way yeah. you make it like okay with it. And then um like I said, even with uh Jamie Presley's character as uh, Cynthia, it's just like okay, like dude, you can talk to Patty fine, but with, with Cynthia you're like eh, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, dude, she's like I said, she's attractive, dude, but she's not more attractive than some of the girls in this house. You need to chill the fuck out on this but it still is like like i said it's not this amazing film and it's not even on american pie level in terms of raunchy sex comedies because that has a lot you know more likable characters better written characters you know stuff like that but it's still just a fun movie much like tom cats was that we talked about earlier this year it's like look tom cats is not fucking shawshank it's raunchy it's stupidly written the comedy you know is is average to below average at best but it's it also had jamie presley. Make, what's that <laughs> and it also had jamie presley also has jamie presley <laughs> but it, it's the cast that makes it work same thing with like buying the cow not written the greatest but it's the cast my thing is okay, jonathan work. tucker we both really like jonathan tucker 
First of all, he looks so young in this movie. I swear, he looks and well, sounds like he's before. This is before he got all ripped up and shit. Like, well, oh. that's well, that's the thing is, is he looks and sounds like he's like fifteen years old, and he looks like you know, like young Will you know, you know, or something. You know who he reminds me of? Who's that? It, obviously, not in terms of dialect or anything. Kind of like Anton Yelchin. A little bit. And the bit. movie, he's a little bit like 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 Charlie Bartlett. Bartlett, like Anton Yelchin, Charlie Bartlett, because like because oh. like. Bit. My only problem with with him in this movie is like because I, I like him and it's like if this was a high school movie maybe I mean still be kind of like he'd still be more like the dork of the school. You but almost just, have to have it be like a boarding school for that. To work, I just though. didn't buy him as like this ladies man that all the girls were falling in love with and things like this, and especially more, with Emmanuel Shikri. I I I don't see that. But but, but but that's why that's why I think it, that this movie works the way it does to get to that point because he's not like the hot guy or anything like that. He is kind of a wordy nerd, but he builds that relationship with all of them throughout the course of that semester by he being the only guy in that dorm, which he's not. Cause there's that one point where he loses the foosball table and he has to strip. And there's a random dude just walking like by like looking like what the fuck's going on here. So he's well, not later on. The, the, the other boyfriend is in the same dorm. Okay, okay, and... let, but yeah, we're don't worry. Crick cricket. Crick's going to get talked about. Because you yeah. can't, we can't not talk about Crick, but it's um, but it's one of those things where it's like he's built this relationship, being the one guy that's always been in the dorm, that and and talking to them, you know, kind of treating them with respect for the most part to a point. Because even even with that, he's, he's not like, oh, let me let me go into the bathroom and watch him in the shower. Like he's not doing anything creepy like that. I mean, yes, he is checking for their panties because that's the only thing he remembers <laughs> from the the elevator is is her panties because I think she left it like in the elevator because yeah, like, she dropped the pair, yeah. yeah. So, like, in terms of that, yes, that's creepy, but that's the only thing he can go off of. Um, which, I'm sorry, Emmanuel's voice is very... I'm not saying she has a dialect, but it's like, you spent the whole night talking to her in the elevator, you didn't recognize her voice when you were talking to her earlier, because it's, it's... Yeah, okay, whatever. And you can check that out, too. He's a guy. He doesn't pay attention to that shit. But the ab- believability by the end of the film when he does his big speech... He's grown with these women over this this last semester, so the believability that they would at least date him makes more plausible sense than if he had just randomly started doing that shit. So I think I think they build the the path through the film for it to make sense for that. Crick, the guy. How does this character work? He's a full on rapist in this movie. Well, and at least they call him on that later in the movie. They call, yeah, they do, but it's like. How how is this character even around? First off, how is he getting in the dorm? Because like like he has like like Matthew has to go through all these hoops to be like an electrician. Which granted, good job for being a handyman, by the way, because you you are fixing shit. And you're not getting paid to do it, but like he has to go through all this stuff, and he just walks in and apparently is full on sexually harassing everyone in that place. He's clearly abusive, but no campus security, no actual police. They just let him walk around and, and do whatever the fuck he wants. And then he has his, his other friend that was there that one day to play in foosball. Once again, another dude just randomly in, in this dorm. But yeah, his character is yikes. I, I, um, the one thing I want to say about this character is um, I, I believe it's the first scene where he where he's trying to get rid of him. It is the first scene. The chewing the gum and the, and the titty twister. But they end up in the, the, the nipple fight, basically. Yeah. And that reminded me so much of Tammy and the T Rex. <laughs> When they're both grabbing it's each other's totally junk, yeah. and neither one it would totally let go, is. it, it totally, totally reminded me that because they're both doing the titty twist at the same time, it's and they're doing like a slow motion, like. Uh... Although Crick was Crick was grabbing uh, Matthews like right here, I'm like, where are your nipples, Matthew? Because he's. I mean, <laughs> he could have. He could have. I love how we're describing, you know, titty twistering. Yeah. He could have grabbed and lifted up, and maybe that's where he was doing. If not, Jonathan Tucker's. I, I actually, we I've seen Jonathan Tucker shirt shirtless because he was on the the MMA show Kingdom with. Frank Grillo, who and he's fucking amazing in that. Everyone should watch that show. Um, I think it's three seasons. Oh, oh we we love. I mean, we we already talked about him on was it Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah. We we did the ruins. Did we do yep. hostage? We were going to do hostage. We were too. going to do hostage. I think we changed the two did. different. Yeah. Because anyway. we wanted to talk about him and Ben Foster because they're both fantastic in that movie. But then I think we I think it was one of the movies we were going to, and then it was one of the movies we had to cancel, mm-hmm. or we just decided to watch something else. But yeah, Jonathan Tucker, this is this is baby Jonathan Tucker. Like he has he hadn't reached that level of like, I love this guy. But it was one of those things like when we started paying attention to Jonathan, I'm like, that's the guy from Hunger Girls. 
okay. And so that helped to, to, to start the path for him. But yeah, this movie, it, like I said, it, I'm not saying you guys need to go out of your way to watch this or anything, but this is just one of those those guilty pleasure films of Brian and I's, which you said, when was the last time you watched this before before this week? Oh, I it it's before 2012 because I don't have a logged in letterbox. So I, I want to say I probably haven't watched it since 2000 and I think six, seven, eight. I think the last time I watched this, I was still in high school. Yeah. It might have been that that like week long stretch where it was on because you watch that movie every night for like a week or something. You don't need to watch that movie for a long time. But then like like I said, it disappeared because like it was never like you never you never find the DVDs, you know. And so it's one of those like it's like a oh I this it like will pop up. Jonathan Tucker's like oh yeah, Hundred Girls. It's like oh is it on anything? No, okay. And then you forget about it for the next six years. I will say one thing I loved about this movie, and because it has been long since I had to watch this movie, but I found it it very comforting. It was like this. First of all, from the opening scene, from the from the opening yeah. song, the whole soundtrack is oh so like nineties two thousand. Well, it it's very comforting to the point because I, I it reminded me a lot of 40, 40 days forty nights. Yeah, I I love the soundtrack to this movie. Um, and then it, and then just the fact that it was like this this pre internet world. Because he wasn't doing any research on people, it wasn't people texting each other. What all this thing? It was just mm-hmm. like he was doing the footwork and meeting people in person. And I just, I just loved the setting of it. I mean, there was newspaper classified ads. You know, they were he was using to try and find people. There was the hallway shared landline phone in the dorms. It's just like something about this movie. Just like you know, brought me back to better times. <laughs> for a second there, I thought the crying girl on the payphone was Julie Bowen, and I was like, no, she's too old for. This. No, she'd be too old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I was like, she was doing Happy Gilmore before this like she'd be too old for that see which is more i think it was more the hairstyle and stuff i was like oh it's definitely not julie bowman <laughs> um but any anything else you'd like to add for 100 girls um no no there was there was weird nitpicks i went oh oh so my, the, first of all in the dorms okay the dorm size the dorms room is this thing are the size of like small apartments which is funny and nobody locks their doors but what gets me is is when um when matthew and the roommate was the roommate's name oh yeah. uh rock Rod. Matthew and Rod were what were like watching them and he's like looking in all the windows stuff. They have a telescope in front of them so they can like look in and all of them. But first of all, the girls do everything in front of open windows apparently. But also yeah. Rod, they're sitting in front of the telescope and so in theory far away looking in the dorm, but they're not looking through the telescope. And he's like, What's that? Who's that girl with the green slime? It's like, what kind of vision do you have? <laughs> it's like you can't also, also uh Francesca, that whole scene where he decided I'm just gonna dress like a woman. Oh, <laughs> points of the movie. yeah. I mean, I've never been a whole fan of the whole, you know, cross dress to try and fool everybody because it's a never convincing and B, it's just kind of stupid. Yeah, you know, like, like, you know, I didn't love sorority boys, but it was like, OK, at least they kept that to a minimum in this movie. Yeah, yeah like I said, it was just more or less so he could kind of talk to them and ask them questions that he couldn't ask as as himself. So it wasn't like a, am going to do this the whole way, go all the way through. It's like, no, I guess he does it like maybe a handful of times just so that way he can get some questions asked that he can't directly ask them but it doesn't like dictate or derail a movie it's just more like oh okay he dressed like a girl for a couple moments so you get feel it like it's like to be a girl to a point but yeah. it's like it's like a it's like a snippet of the film it's not like a over yeah, it's, it's a very small part of it. yeah. um i will say by by the end i mean at the end of the day i i, I it's not as good as i remember it being um it's exactly but, how I remembered it. But I, like <laughs> I said, just, despite the things that, that the problems I have with it, whether it be the dialogue, whatever, it's like, I still enjoy watching it. I'm not yeah. going to say that it is a, a good movie. I mean, it's not a bad movie. But it's not like, oh, this is a great, like you said, you're not going to tell somebody to go out of their way to watch it. But I watched it and like, I enjoyed it. I mean, I won't rewatch it again this weekend or anything, but give it a couple of years. I'll check it out again. I don't think it's not on anything though, is it? Oh, it's everywhere. It's it's, it's free, really- like on all kinds of the the... Um, ones with free free with ads and it's also on amazon prime so that's right i watched it on prime i was like i was like i was trying to remember as soon as i said i was like Wait, how did i watch it because i watched it on prime because fisher king uh no fisher king was not, on prime. Was not anywhere. Yeah. no last week's movies were both on prime oh, that's that's what's getting me but i will say um, the one thing that surprised me about this movie the only other movie this director has made that i even have heard of was shoot him up with clive owen <laughs> like that is which, a weird... I, which i actually enjoy that movie a lot of people don't i enjoy that movie that's probably one of my favorite Clive Owen films because I just Clive Owen's just going full on balls and Paul Giamatti chewing the scenery the whole way through. Um, uh, but yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you guys did, go ahead that like, share, and subscribe to the channel so you guys stay up to date with all the latest videos pop up on the Weekly Crusaders. Of course, you have to follow us on all the social media as you see below. 
Coming up next, we are now into October. Uh, our Halloween episode that we shot last year is out right now. Um, basically, it's a kind of like one of those 30-day challenges where we say, hey, um, on this day, pick a movie based off of this topic. And we both gave movies that were not necessarily movies that you would think. Some some days we just had to because we were, you know, there wasn't a good choice. But we definitely decided to choose some movies that were um, a little maybe under the radar kind of thing. Uh, so that's out right now. Feel free to check that out. Um, some of the movies we have talked about this year and more of those movies we're going to be talking about during this month on Week of Crusaders. One of them for me next week. Exactly, including this, this <laughs> upcoming week. Um, so next week's, uh, th or this week's videos, cause we're, we're shooting this late. Uh, my movie is an early two thousands, uh, horror film that, uh, honestly went into it with the lowest of expectations. And I can't hear a word without immediately responding <laughs> to that word because of this film. Uh, and then, uh, Brian's film is a movie that I have never seen, but it was on our holiday special or Halloween special. And so now I finally get to watch it. Uh, so that and I'm a little worried nothing. that I've overhyped it for him, but I don't care. Honestly, the big thing that's going to save you is is the lead actress in the film because I love her. So that it'll be like I liked her in it, but I hated the movie. So we'll see what happens when I watch it. Um, so figure out what those two movies are. Good luck because those were not good clues. Um, coming. Uh, let's see. We got the hot. We the Halloween specials out right now. Um, did you? I did not see Creator, guys. I. I'm busy doing a lot of stuff personally. And I, movies right now are kind of on the back burner to a point, at least going to the theater. It's on the back burner. Been. Yeah. Well, at least going to the theater, like streaming stuff. I, I did watch Flora and son uh, on Apple. Um, probably not going to shoot a review for it. Uh, I love sing street. Um, it was one of those surprise movies, uh, when it came out this it's good. This is good. It's not as good as sing street. It is good. Um, I did enjoy it. I would recommend it for anyone who liked sing street um it's on apple uh i think it's i gave it a solid uh four or three and a half four star uh score for i think it was like a 76 percent or something like that i have to look it up of course here's the score it might not be 76 I, I, that's where my brain's at right now I, actually no i think it was an 83 now i think about it it's an 82 or an 83 percent um but uh i did not see the creator did you finally go see it or no i did see the creator um I, I will say that I had seen some reviews just like raving about it as like a new sci-fi classic set my expectations way too high. Um, it is a good movie. And it, first of all, it looks beautiful. I love the look and the style of this movie. That's all I kept hearing is that it looks gorgeous. But and honestly, and, and the actual performances, the John David Washington, everybody in this movie, it does a really good job. The story is a little okay. I mean, I still, I, I think I ended up getting it four stars out of five. Um, so I, I did enjoy it. It's just, it just, I, I went in there. I had my expectations yeah. propped up a little too high, but I enjoyed it. Also came out this week, a week early was, uh, Netflix's reptile. I have not got to watch that yet. Did you eventually get to watch it? No, you haven't. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing that I watched this past weekend, and I know we don't talk about TV a whole lot, but I want to give this a special shout out. Uh, also, uh, Ahsoka finale is this week. So we may or may not be shooting an Ahsoka series, uh, video, We'll decide that after we see the last episode. <laughs> um, but one special shout out for me. And Brian, did you watch these yet or no? I have not. You have not. Okay. Obviously, we're both fans of The Boys. Um, Gen V came out this past week. Uh, the first three episodes. Brian has not watched them yet. I have watched them. I fucking love this. I went in with like, all right, let's. It's college version of The Boys. Eh, we'll see what it's like. Dude, it is right. It is one. I was gonna 1A. say, do you like it better than the boys? It is, it is one one a. Well, because with the boys, I it had it had actors I knew, so it was like I have that like oh I I love the actor who plays Homelander because I loved him in Banshee, and, and and stuff. And of course we knew um, wow, blanking on his name. Uh, Jack Quaid. Who, what? What? Jack Quaid. Yeah, we we knew Jack Quaid and stuff like that. So we, and and Elizabeth Shue. So we had those actors. This is um, all a cast of people I don't know, except for uh, Sean Patrick Thomas plays the father of somebody. Oh, okay. In, in, the, in, in the show, I'm not going to say who, um, but he's like the only person. Oh, and uh, Arnold's son, Patrick Schwarzenegger, he's in this. Oh. Um, but uh, but other than that, it's a relative no name cast. But the first scene, the first scene sets you right off. You're watching. You're like. Oh, oh my god 
And by the end of the first episode, I was like, thank you so much for giving me three episodes. Because if that would, if the, if the, if it would have ended on the first episode and I had to wait a week, I would have been so mad. First three episodes are fantastic. It's like the boys in its grotesqueness, its goriness, its sexuality. Oh, it is. I'm glad to hear it started off like that too, because like, if I recall the first scene of the boys was, uh, him running through and killing Jack Quaid's girlfriend, yes, right? a girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, if not the first scene, no, no, no. The first scene was Homelander chasing those those guys, uh, and then it went to the Jack Quaid. Oh, part. gotcha, gotcha. But but no, this is um, yeah, this is this is it, I high 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 marks. If you guys are fans of the boys and you guys have been like, ah, I'm not gonna watch this spinoff, do, do. But make sure you're caught up on the boys first because they do say some things that happened at the end of season three. So there's your warning for that, but definitely check out Gen V. You will not be disappointed. And also actress who I didn't know of, but I am so fast falling in love with her as an actress and a character. She plays Emma. Uh, let me pull her up here real quick. Uh, she plays Emma slash cricket on the show. Um, love her. Uh, trying to get her name real quick here. Of course, IVB's being a pain. Um, this, this girl's going to be huge. Uh, Lizzie. Come on, stop jumping out. Lizzie Broadway. Love her in the show. I think she's going to become huge because of this. Uh, but definitely, yes. Definitely check out Gen V. Check back out on that Halloween episode that we did last year. There's a bit, that was 61, 62 movies we talked about on that show. All Something worth like watching, that. in our opinions, all worth watching. Um, but yeah, we'll be back here later this week for this week's episode of the Weekly Crusaders. Um, in terms of movies this week, is there anything? Yeah, there's... Um... Foe, the uh, uh, Sir Ronan movie coming out, uh, Freelance, John Cena, and Alison yeah, Brie. Brie. That one, uh, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, um, The Exorcist is the main theatrical release. That's right. I may or uh, may she, not get to check. I want to. I want to see it. I just don't know if I will get to see it this week. Yeah, she came to me. Uh, it's going to be a small release. I probably am going to be able to see it that weekend, but I have to like drive a half hour to see it. So I'm sure it's going nowhere near you. No, there's no way. Um, I'm get that. And then, and then on, I think it's Amazon. It's totally killer, which I'm hopeful for. The trailer yeah. didn't blow me away though. So we'll see. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, until next time, we are the Moon Crusaders. I'm Sean Wallace-Krug. That is Brian Michaels. And in case we don't see you, go watch some movies and go have some fun. You're still here. It's over. Go home.